Well, hello again everybody. Now a few weeks ago I was messing around with uh, cutting out a metal bracket for my Ahuga horn and uh, I think you saw me using a great big pair of scissors. Well that isn't actually what I intended to use for the job. Um, the first time I recorded that video you would have seen me outside using this thing. It's a dropping half of it. Now, for you, those of you that don't know what this is, this is actually what they call a, a plasma cutter, which uses, um, well, a very high temperature stream of gas to cut through a sheet of metal. To be quite honest, I'm not an expert on plasma cutters, so I'm not going to go into a huge amount of details of how they operate. But this is basically the, uh, the business end. This is a, a cutting torch. So you can see that it's got a big, thick tube on here. So what you've got on this big, inside this big, thick tube We've got the um, well. We've got a, an electricity supply, so we've got a, a thick cable carrying power to the uh, torch head. We've got a, a tube, and that tube's carrying compressed air, and that compressed air uh, comes out of the nozzle on here. So when you pull the trigger on this torch, it turns on the compressed air supply, and it also turns on the electricity to the uh, to the torch head. And what happens is you get an an arc which is struck between the uh, the nozzle here and the piece of metal you're trying to cut through and uh, you know that arc is it's got a lot of current behind it so it's effectively a red hot spark if you like now blowing through this spark or around this spark you've got some um, some compressed air and that compressed air gets so hot hot well it ceases to become a a gas it stops being uh, you know what we call a gas and it goes into this plasma state and plasma is just a, a fancy name for superheated gas so it uses the electrical arc to uh, superheat the gas that comes out of here and uh, that's what gets blasted into the metal so I think that the compressed air does a few things it cools the torch because we don't want the uh, torch to melt and then the arc which is struck against the piece of metal that we uh, want to cut, it starts to melt the metal. So I think the compressed air probably encourages that metal to perhaps uh, be blown away. So it blows the molten metal out of the way. Now there's an awful lot of different uh, cutting torches on the market. And uh, for those playing along at home, the model that I'm using here is one that actually comes with the plasma cutter. And it's a PT40. So hopefully you can see there, we've got a little hole in the end of the tip. So this is where our plasma squirts out of and into the piece of metal we want to cut. Got a trigger control here. And uh, there's various uh, electrodes and consumables and ceramics in here which are all designed to uh, transfer the, uh, the current to the cutting tip and uh, actually insulate the torch and actually cool the torch as well because obviously we don't want the end of the torch here to melt. We want the piece of... Uh, of metal that the uh, the torch is trying to cut to melt so i think part of the again part of the function of the compressed air is probably to keep the internal parts of this torch um, cold or cool enough so they don't melt so from what i've seen most plasma cutters are relatively simple to operate and there's not a lot of controls on them so this machine just has this uh, current uh, control here so we can start off at a, a 10 amp cutting current or we can turn it right up to uh, 30 which is maximum and then on the back side here, we've got a pressure regulator with a water trap. And uh, that regulator has got, it's got a gauge on the side of it here. So one thing that you often have to do is you've got to, uh, you've got to just adjust the, uh, the cutting pressure, the, the airflow into the machine. And off the top of my head, I think you set that to about uh, 55 PSI, I think it is. Now I just mentioned that the, uh, the regulator here has got a water trap on it. And uh, it's really important that for uh, for plasma cutter, if you've got a plasma cutter or you're thinking about getting one, um, you need to have a very dry air supply. So um, the purpose of this is to remove a little bit of water and contaminants, but it's probably a good idea to make sure you've got a reasonably good compressor um, and that maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to install a dryer in line with your uh, air supply, your compressed air supply. You can get separate air dryer units which uh, plug into your airline and remove uh, moisture. And I've actually I've got one of them as well. Um, it's, it's permanently installed in the garage. So when I run this machine, uh, it receives um, an air supply which is dry. It's got less moisture in it, 
than uh, you know a normal air supply would be and I think the reason is that if you get any moisture in the cutting head here because um, you tend to get a lot of moisture coming out of the compressed air probably sort of function of it being compressed I'm not exactly sure but uh, a lot of moisture gets released and if you get water and moisture in the cutting head um, what it tends to do is uh, it makes the um, it makes the cutting less reliable uh, probably makes it spit and, and blow but the other thing it does is that it uh, it also massively reduces the life of the uh, of the consumables of the parts in the cutting head so you want to make sure that you feed uh, your plasma cutter with uh, the driest possible air and that'd include if you've got a drain valve on the bottom of your compressor again before you do any plasma cutting probably a good idea to drain the uh, draw, drain the water off your compressor using the drain valve at the bottom so the basic problem I've got with this machine at the moment is that it doesn't work at all it, it it doesn't do anything really you plug it in switch it on the only thing you hear is the fan spins up um, but it won't cut and the other thing is there's a number of indicator lights on here which uh, indicate things like you know if it's over temperature if the uh, cutting nozzle is assembled correctly um, if it's got power that's a there should be a green light here a power indicator well none of these indicator lamps are functioning it so you know the user interface doesn't work so to all intensive purposes, this machine is just dead. And you never know, we might get lucky. It could be just be a very simple fault. You know, it could be a blown fuse or something. But, uh, yeah, we don't normally get that lucky, do we? Now, of course, I'm not exactly certain how this operates. And unfortunately, I haven't got any circuit diagrams for it. So I think, ultimately, I may be uh, a little bit stuck. So I think it's really just a matter of you know, trying to do the first things first, look for anything obvious. Now, there's no reason why it should have failed because, well, effectively, it is like it is like new. So let's just check the obvious things first. I can see a fuse down there, so uh, let's just see what sort of state the fuse is in. So it seems like we've got a good fuse. Now, the problem that I was getting is that... Um, I say it didn't work. Well, the unit didn't even appear to try to power up it. It wasn't getting any power. So I guess one of the first things is just to try and trace out the, uh, you know, the power supply. It looks as though there's really just a couple of big circuit boards in here. There's uh, this one I'm trying to install the fuse back in at the moment. And um, there's a small little, little board here that looks as though it's got some... Uh, microprocessor goodness on it I don't know maybe some kind of digital logic control board but certainly all the power electronics is on this big board here I haven't actually got enough uh, power in here to operate it because it needs a 16 amp supply but hopefully we might just get enough to make the thing power up so we switch on and the first thing we get is we get a fan starting up but um, there's actually an LED power indicator on the front of here and unfortunately the LED power indicator isn't lighting up so although we're getting um, an AC supply there's obviously no um, low voltage DC being generated so we could do with just trying to figure out why that is well as I said earlier I don't actually have any circuit diagrams for this plasma cutter so all I can really do is check out the basic stuff and uh, I always remember something that that Dave Jones says off EV blog and he kind of jokes that I shall check power supplies. So we've got this basically, this whole thing is really one big power supply but we've got um, a controller board here, a little controller board which plugs into the back unit. So the first thing I, I went and did is I can see that on here we've got this header connector and it's got a zero volts and a five volt connection and I've gone ahead and I've probed that and uh, there's no five volts on there and... Um, so that that looks like a problem to me that the uh, there's there's no power supply on the board or there's certainly no logic supply to this board. So this board actually plugs in. So I've just gone ahead and I've undone it and uh, there we go. We can just pull it out. So it looks like that this is the uh, the brains of the unit. I'm going to guess that this is a uh, some kind of a microcontroller under here and that number on it is probably a firmware number. Um, don't really know an awful lot about it. Luckily, it has actually got some uh, information written on the header connector here. It says things like uh, 0 volts or 24 volts, 
plus and minus 15 volts. I've had a look at this board and I can't actually see anything obviously burnt out or wrong with it. But let's go back and let's check our power supplies. Quite an awkward thing to work on. I said earlier that because of all the cables and the way it's actually assembled, you've kind of got some things mounted to the back plate and a lot of things that are screwed through the PCB onto the back plate. So it's not really very easy to uh, get access to anything. So here's a female part of our header connector and uh, luckily it's got some labels on. So we've got zero volts and we've got a header called test SDCACB zero volts K1 uh, it looks like A1 or AN, but then we've got a 24 volts, a 0 volts, 0 volts, minus 15, I think that's plus 15, and then plus 5. So we may as well just switch this on and let's check our supply rails. Now I've got to admit I'm uh, a little bit cautious doing this. This thing is a, a very high power power supply. Um, you know, it's capable of generating 30 or 40 amps at about 100 volts. So it's not something that I really want to uh, short anything out on. So I'm going to go on the, uh, I'm trying to keep my fingers out, I'm going to go on the zero volts. And I've got my voltmeter here just out of shot set to um, DC. Let me see if I can get that in, because I don't think you can see what I'm probing anyway. Let me, let me see if I can go on the 24 volt connection. Okay, so we've got a 24 volts there, so that's good. And the next terminal is zero volts. And we've got zero volts. And we've got another zero volts. Sorry, that's wrong. But we've got another zero volts. Yep, zero volts. And we've got minus 15. And we've got our minus 15 volt supply rail, so that's good. The next one should be plus 15 volts, which we haven't got. So we've got no plus 15 volts. And we've also got no 5 volts. So if I was to guess, I would say that the, uh, the plus 15 and the plus 5 volt rails are they're not working for some reason. And it's actually quite likely that it's the uh, plus 15 volt rail that's failed. Because typically when you have a step down uh, system like this, you'll probably step down from 24 to 15. And then you'll drop from 15 to 5. And that's to uh, minimise the dissipation in the uh, regulators. So we've just got to find the regulators, which I think I've just spotted. Now I've pulled out that large board, I can see some regulators down there, or, or at least there are two free pin jobbies. So they look like regulators, but I can't quite see the number on. I'm going to turn off. So you can see, even though I've switched the power off to this, I'm going to unplug it. The fan's still running. And I think that basically that is being uh, stored in these large capacitors here. And I'm guessing that maybe the fan runs off a 24 volt supply or something like that. So even when we depower the device, when we unplug it, the fan stays running for quite a while. Now unfortunately I don't think I can get the camera angle on here. But I can see something down here. I can just about make out the writing on this one. And it's a 7805, so that's a 5 volt regulator. And then there's another 3 free pin jobby next to it and I'm going to guess that that's a plus 15 volt regulator unfortunately I can't see the markings on this one they're very very faint and they're also kind of tuck behind this um, large uh, inductor uh, sorry well, I think this is a switch mode transformer we've got here um, yeah let's have a quick look round it now I've never had a plasma cutter apart before, but I've got a rough understanding of how these things work. So what you're going to have, you're going to have the mains coming in, and I wouldn't be surprised if the main comes straight in and then maybe gets, um, maybe just it gets rectified to a fairly high voltage. I don't know, I'm, I'm guessing here, maybe it gets rectified. And if it's something like a normal switch mode power supply, we've got some large... Um, IGBT transistors which are bolted to the underside of this heat sink which I'm afraid you can't see. I'm guessing that this here is the main switching transformer here and then this device here that I'm poking away at this one here I think that is just basically a large choke and the purpose of that choke is this um, this inverter has got something called a pilot arc where it actually sends a high frequency signal into the torch head which is used to establish the arc so I think that the uh, I think the thing that probably injects the arc is 
is down here, um, sorry, that injects a pilot arc onto the t torch head. I think that's that component down there. But you don't want all that nasty, um, you know, high frequency HF get back into the sw DC switch mode supply. So I think that this component here is just basically a big choke, just a big blocking choke to stop the HF getting back into the DC part of the power supply. Um, so I think what we could do, we're doing now, is if I can very carefully get my voltmeter probes down here onto the legs of these uh I, I say i'm going to guess that there's a regulator this one on the left hand side is is definitely a five volt regulator but i'm not sure about the one on the right i'm taking a guess it's plus 15. so the first thing i'm going to do i'm going to just go ahead and see if i can uh, get a voltage of this five volt regulator so there's nothing on the input of the regulator and there's nothing on the output of the regulator so next, next one I'm going to test is this 15 volt regulator. So there's nothing on the output of it. But we've got 23 volts on the input to it. So I'm going to guess that that plus 15 volt regulator has failed. And I can see looking at the circuit that the output from the 15 volt regulator goes straight. So the output from the 15 volt regulator go straight into the input of the 5 volt regulator. So if that plus 15 volt regulator is going to open circuit then the 5 volt regulator is not going to work. Problem is we're going to have to strip all this down to get inside it and I think it's going to be a bit of a bugger. So let's unplug and let everything discharge. And in fact I'm probably going to leave this for half an hour to power down because uh, there's a lot of potential energy stored in here and we don't want to flash anything over. So I'm going to go and have a cup of tea now, let everything discharge and when we've done that we're going to start the uh, disassembly process which I think is going to be a little bit tricky. So I'm afraid I think this is just going to be a case of undoing every, uh, every screw in sight until uh, it actually comes apart. This thing definitely wants to fight me all the way. <laughs> oh dear, got a big tangle of wires and bits of plasma cutter guts. Come on. Snippy, snippy, snip. Oh, that's a bit better. This thing's never going to go back together, is it? <laughs> Place your bets, is it going to go back together? Yeah, of course it will. Of course it will. No, it absolutely doesn't want to come undone, that one. Should we just get the whole valve stack? Yeah, that's a possibility, isn't it? Let's, take, let's release the whole valve stack, it should go with it. And we can get the remains of this uh, body out the way now. That's going to make it a bit easier to work on. Now I was just trying to decide whether or not to unscrew the uh, the board from its little standoff pillars or just release the uh, standoff pillars and drop the whole board off. I think it's probably the uh, a similar amount of work, <coughs> whichever one I do. I'm sure I'll regret it. This is one of them jobs, whichever way around you attempt it. Um, Still going to be wrong. And we've got the whole uh, fun of spinning pillow pillars. Yeah. 
Now of course we're taking this circuit board off with the hope that we're uh, going to be able to just change out this regulator and uh, you know the jobs are good and but you know it might not it might not be the regulator it could be something totally you know totally different to that all right maybe just one nut there it's funny they've used screws absolutely everywhere apart from that one that's uh, that's got a nut on it I wonder why they did that is that off now is it going to come yep now can you see the massive size of the tracks on this circuit board and not only are the tracks big the uh, the actual quantity of solder that's on the tracks they've obviously uh, increased the solder just to uh, try and lower the resistance of the tracks to increase the current carrying capabilities now, I don't you can see that the whole board is also covered in a conformal coating there's actually a bit of accumulation of it there and uh, they've done that to uh, I guess for two reasons, one to give it a bit more insulation but this is using a dirty workshop environment where you probably have a lot of metal particles so they don't want the uh, the metal dust shorting everything out. Got some little insulation gaps here, can you see that one insulation gap, insulation gap, another insulation gap and another insulation gap there. Um, what else have we got? Oh and we've also got a nice little touch here, you can see these resistors they've actually uh, milled the board out where these resistors go so I'm guessing that those resistors must dissipate a bit of power so they just actually milled the board out around them just to again to increase the uh, the cooling around those resistors and uh, annoyingly um, again probably still can't bring you in but these regulators down here I've just noticed that rather than being um, floating around or even screwed in they've, um, they've spared no expense and they've actually uh, riveted the uh, the regulator to the back of the PCB. So we're looking at the back of the board here where the two regulators are and you can see that there's the uh, there's the pins so this is the 5 volt one and this is the uh, the 15 volt one and you can see they've spared no expense here that rather than using a nut and bolt to actually hold those regulators down they've actually riveted them in and um, yeah <clears throat> that just makes it all just a little bit more painful doesn't it. I suspect maybe the reason, I was going to say maybe they've riveted them in because, well I think I know why they've maybe riveted them in because there's actually uh, this large switch mode transformer mounted on top of it which means that the actual nut and bolt that you would need to get at, you can't get at them because this uh, transformer's in the way. As usual this solder sucker sounds like a dying asthmatic. It's doing bugger all. It's funny, I was chatting uh, to Mike at, I think it's Mike's radio repair the other day, and uh, you know, he was telling me how much how much he likes his pasty soldering stations and how well they work, but um, I've certainly just had no luck with this one. It's just got no suck to it whatsoever. Really poor. Now, I think I'm definitely going to have to uh, take this main switching transformer off because it's the only way I'm going to be able to get access to a drill down there to uh, to drill that rivet out so uh, looks like there's some thermal overload or something some couple of windings here and I'm guessing that's what they are they say uh, TRM term but um, I reckon that might be uh, temperature or thermal overload because these are typically the kind of windings so these these are going into the outer windings of this transformer and there's another uh, stud mounted device here on this heat sink um, hopefully you can see it well that's got wires running back to about the same circuit position on here so I think these are some form of uh, thermal overload protection so we're going to have to release them so we can cut these two cable ties and then take the big inductor off <laughs> So let's just chest that theory. I expect to see a short circuit across these two. Which we do. So that, that as I said, it's just a thermal overload device. Uh, and it's just going into the uh, transformer windings here. So if the transformer starts to overheat, it must shut down the machine. Now in theory now, I should be able to uh, cut this inductor off. So 
So just looking at the design of this circuit board, it really doesn't look as though it's been designed with repair in mind. I'm guessing that if you get a fault on this type of equipment, the idea would be that maybe you just put a whole new, you know, circuit board in a whole new uh, assembly and, you know, get charged for the uh, the privilege, which it kind of is quite annoying because it's quite an expensive piece of equipment this i can't remember how much it was when i bought it i think it was around five or six hundred pounds it was relatively expensive and uh you know when you pay that kind of money you expect you know the piece of equipment to uh, last a fair amount of time and if it does go wrong you'd expect a fairly reasonable repair cost but um yeah the only, i'm pretty sure the only way you could repair this is just to throw a whole new board assembly in and uh, that's maybe what they do. I'd love to hear from anybody who does repair welding sets, like commercially and stuff like that. Um, would you repair this or would you just put a whole new circuit board in? I'd be interested to know that. Okay, we've got the little bugger off now. And uh, there's the offending regulator. So I think what I'll do now off camera, I'm going to take this circuit board into the garage and I'm going to drill this rivet out that's securing this 15 volt regulator and we'll uh, we'll pop a new regulator in and uh, I think we might just partially assemble it and see if there's any life in it and uh, if it doesn't work I think it's going straight in the bin or going straight on eBay. Well I've gone ahead and I've drilled out that regulator and uh, there it is and uh, so it has come out of the board. Before I install the new regulator, it's worth just checking the resistance on the rails just to see if there's any obvious uh, short circuits because there wouldn't really be any point in uh, just putting a new regulator and there's a dead short across it. So uh, let's do some tests. And of course the fault could actually be on the 5 volt regulator so I'm going to start with that one first. So uh, input to ground. Three kilo, six kilo and increasing, so that's some capacitor charging. Ground to output. Again, that's ramping up. Let's just check input to output. 0.6 meg. So there's no, uh, there's no gross shorts to ground there anyway. And let's just do the same now for the 15 volt rail. So input to ground. Two kilo ohm and climbing, ground to output, one mega ohm, fine, and input to output of the device, one mega ohm. So there's not an obvious DC shot, but you've got to ask yourself why did that regulator fail? Um, yeah, why? I don't know. Sometimes regulators do just fail, but it's usually because they've been overloaded or you know, there's a short circuit on the actual um, power supply rail, the thing that they're powering. So I'm a little bit concerned that I haven't got to the bottom of what the actual failure was. But um, mm, sometimes you never do, do you? So looking at the offending regulator we've removed, there really isn't anything uh, obviously wrong with it. And I have tested, there's no short circuits or anything like that. But yeah, for some reason it doesn't work. And I have checked the part number. I wasn't able to see it before, but the... Uh, the part number is a, what is it, a, God, it's fairly visible, it's, I think it's L7815CV, which um, matches what I've got here, which is an L781CV, so, uh, I don't know, made in China, so maybe that's its cousin, I don't know. So there's always that little bit of fun, isn't it, that you've got your 5 volt regulator, but you need to actually bend the pins on it so that they actually... Uh, line up with the mounting hole and the three pins that you know the secure it into the board so let's try and guess what that is I'm gonna I'm gonna guess that put a bit of a soft bend on them so it should be a little bit tolerant of getting it wrong and I'm sorry my voice again is a bit croaky. I'm still fighting off the remnants of a quite a bad cold I had the other week, you know, touch a man flu. And uh, I'm an awful lot better than I was, but I really was sick as a dog. It was a really kind of nasty cold virus I had. And uh, 
yeah, I had a few days off work, which is not like me, and uh, it's like three weeks later, and I'm, that's one of the reasons I haven't been making videos, because uh, I've just, I wouldn't say I've been feeling rough, but my voice has been very croaky, and I've been, you know, coughing and sneezing, coughing a lot. But uh, yeah, I'm on the mend now, so uh, all is good. Fighting me all the way. <laughs> Can't even get a nut on. Let's just go ahead and uh, solder it up now. And then we've got these thermal overloads to put back. And then I think I'm tempted just to put some power on it very carefully. And oh, I'll say carefully, I'm just going to power it up. Let's power it up and see if we've got our 5 volt rail back and our plus 15 volt rail. And fingers crossed we will have. And if we haven't, oh well, mm, not so good. Well I've gone ahead and I've bolted down this high frequency transformer as, uh, as well as I can and uh, I think we're ready to connect now the uh, the mains power leads which are they are these two here, yeah, I've wired them switch so uh, actually let's do the bottom one first, that one we'll go on, yes that's on and then this one and then we need some mains action so I'm a bit hesitant to sort of have to reach over. I don't like bending over things when I've repaired them for switch on. So, oh, well it's making noise. Nothing's smoking. Let's just put this on volts. Have we got 24? Yep, there's our 24 volt rail. Minus 15 volt rail. So the next one should be plus 15 which is a regulator that we changed, so that's good, we've got a plus 15 volt rail and finally we've got our plus 5 volt rail so we've now got all our supply rails back so well, it doesn't mean it's fixed, but let's face it, that's a good sign isn't it? Kind of a little note to self here, I was just about to reassemble this into the uh, onto the back plate and uh, that would probably involve of lining up some metal studs now this uh, piece of equipment, I've just had a cup of tea, it's been off about 20 minutes but we've still got 8 volts on these, um, you know, some of these big smoothing capacitors uh, you can see it's falling there, can you see that 7.5 volts at the moment and it's dropping but if I'd have just switched the unit off and gone ahead and started messing around with a metal back plate it's very likely I would have shorted some pin out on the back of the PCB and uh, you know, could have burnt out one of the logic chips or something like that so again, good practice. Anything with great big capacitors in it like this, awful lot of potential energy stored in here. So uh, you know, before you go prodding around and messing with things, um, either discharge the capacitor so you know you've discharged them, or maybe leave it off for half an hour. Uh, most good equipment should have some discharge resistors built into it so that these capacitors will discharge fairly quickly. But I say most good equipment. You can get bad, dis badly designed equipment that doesn't have any. Uh, Discharge, discharge resistors and that can hold charge for many hours or maybe even days so uh, yeah good practice before you start messing around with stuff like this make sure these big capacitors have uh, fully discharged well as you can see we've got some flashing lights that's going to be a good sign hasn't it
well for today I think I'm going to call that a win so until next time bye bye for now <laughs>